right, we're going to talk about Nemesis Pneumonia. And if you look at some of the older textbooks and older articles and things like that, it can get really confusing. When I was in PA school, they were already kind of in the process of changing names. And so I'm going to try to clarify this the best that I can as far as the nomenclature of this. So, um, so well, first, that's as far as talking about the organism. But uh, talking about the Nemesis Pneumonia, so this is primarily, of course, in HIV-infected patients, so we would see this with low CD4 count. But you can have other cancers and things like that in you know, compromised states where CD4 count is, is low, but it used to be quite rare until, until AIDS came along. Um, so it, it is now recognized as a fungus, um, but before that it was um, classified as, as genus of protozoan organism. It's more of an atypical fungus because it doesn't grow in your typical fungal culture, and this would be important when you try to, you know, test for it and isolate it, figure out if the patient is infected with this, that you can't just order your regular you know, fungal culture and have them grow. Um, part of the cell wall contains the cholesterol, either the ergosterol, and then it's uh, has a life cycle with the trophic form, persistent form, and the cystic form. And so later uh, we'll see some uh, pathology samples. You know, if you've had a um, pulmonologist get all the homage or get a, get a biopsy or something, you, you can probably see a cystic form of this during an infection, but you, you're going to try to isolate the organ organism that's going to be hard to grow. So, um, with the, with the you, you may still see PCP in, in old textbooks referring to the PCP and the resistance pneumonia, but we now use it more as an actual you know, pneumonia caused by this organism. Uh, but if you're going to talk about the organism itself, um, the, uh, the species that infect rats are your pneumocystis um, curini, and the ones that infect humans are the pneumocystis um, gervetii. Um, so when we see the Gervecci as the as the species, that's what we use uh, as far as the organism infecting humans. But you may still see a PCP as a blank term for that organism as well in the older textbooks. Primary mode of transmission is airborne, and quite a few of us may have gotten infected by age of four and didn't know it. Uh, we may clear it and get infected again. Um, and then there's also some person-to-person -person transmission as well. Um, and the, it just can remain in a latent state. Um, and you, know, you may never be bothered by it or get sick or ill unless until the patient becomes immunosuppressed. Although they may become, they may have cleared it and be became newly infected. And it would primarily um, exist in the alveoli of the lungs. So um, this is your AIDS patient, CD4 count less than 200, or if their CD4 cell percentage is less than 14, um, for the test purposes, I would say less than 200. Um, if they've had a previous episode of PCP pneumonia, they're, they're at higher risk of getting it again once their CD4 count drops. Um, if they have oral thrush, but again, that means they're immunocompromised somewhat, that's going to be closer to 200. I've seen some 300, occasional little 400 C4 count, but oral brush and about 200 C4 cells almost always go in and hand. Um, they get a, a recurrent bacterial pneumonia um, that kind of compromises their, their uh, lung, lungs, uh, their alveoli. Uh, they lose a lot of weight. They're, they're not as, the immune system is, is not as Good. And if they have a high viral load, that virus replicates and that's CD4 count, if it's kind of hanging in there, it's going to drop and they're at risk. These patients are going to be dyspneic, hypoxic, and most likely they're going to be running a fever. So if someone's having trouble, severe fatigue, all of a sudden not feeling well, having trouble um, climbing the stairs, um, they're going to have a generally non-productive cough chills, they don't have much appetite, weight loss, but you may have 5 to 10 percent that may have only um, only feel a little fatigue, so they don't even bother mentioning it, or there's some that don't have any symptoms at all. And so, but high 
uh, heart rate um, and uh, fever, dry cough, and dyspnea are, are your, your most common. Uh, on the exam, you may see something, you may hear something, or you may not. If you may hear the crackles in the wrong eye, or you, you may hear everything completely normal. And you may see an oral thrush if you don't know their CD4 count yet. They open their mouth, there's, they, you know, they're below 200. So you're more suspicious of him saying, you know, I just kind of didn't feel that great for the past couple of weeks. I was coming up the stairs in the clinic, and I was a bit out of breath when I got there. And so you're, um, you're going to have a higher suspicious. Since we can't grow the, 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 the organism very well, uh, one of the couple things that help us to diagnose it, um, their LDH will be elevated, so it's not that specific, but in, in this patient uh, presentation, uh, it will be more specific to you. So if you just got an LDH on every month, it doesn't mean that they, they've got the skin pneumonia. But if, if, if this patient from the back with really high LDH, your suspicion is high, you may want to admit them. And they're, if they're hypoxic, of course, um, as far as the, um, we, we have an essay to use to support the diagnosis, and this is um, kind of a, a looking at a component of cell wall of this organism, so we can get, a, get a, a, you know, antibody antigen type of essay looking for this component of the cell wall, and that will be a little bit more help us with our diagnosis. You may have a normal chest x-ray, um, initially, um, so you, on the, it's a big test question. So on the test, if you get a question over HIV, which I've taken boards twice and I don't remember a single question on HIV, I waited for it. Uh, but um, if you've got a diffuse bilateral interstitial or alveoli infiltrates, and uh, you have a, a, you know, on the chest X-ray, you have a patient that's got some myalgia, a little hypoxic in your clinic. That's a the you know, CD4 count of 230 with a little thrush, um, you, you may go ahead and give them the diagnosis. Um, if you get a high resolution CT, then um, this uh, thatcher or nodular ground glass attenuation is also something they like to put on the test as far as the kind of a classic finding on the imaging. So in this slide, and this already went over everything I pretty much said, but one thing is you do want to get the diagnosis because if you're going to start them with some, some strong antibiotics and you're going to hospitalize this patient, you're going to convince a doctor that your patient who's slightly hypoxic uh, and a little myalgia and running a little fever that this patient needs to be in the hospital, uh, then you're going to probably want to, want to get the diagnosis. So we're going to try to get uh, to see the organism either in the sputum production, um, bronchial wall lavage, you can go as far as go with the invasive uh, lung biopsy. And if your patient's already in ICU intubated, then you can do the endotracheal aspirate and you are looking for those. Um, and you're looking for the organism. This is your differential diagnosis, um, and of course, any pneumonia can look can have some of those symptoms. Um, you may have extra pulmonary disease, but it is rare. And if you have multiple sites, non concurrent, non contiguous multiple sites, then you probably have a have a more of a disseminated type of picture. But again, this we won't see this very often. Primarily, you're going to see the pneumonia. Uh, with the, you're, gonna, you're probably going to give them, um, put them on oxygen, you're going to give them steroids, uh, for the, and that's primarily for the hypoxia. If they're not already on interactoral therapy, of course you're going to start them on it. Um, if they're on it, you continue it, and if they have a high viral load and their CD4 count drop, you're going to 
send it off to the you know, to genotype that you can alter your antiretroviral therapy so that your viral load goes down and your immune system recovers to get underneath their immune system to fight this along with whatever else you're doing to treat it. So after um, after you treat them. Um, and there you've got their viral load up, you've got their CD4 count up. You're probably going to keep them, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Oh, here it is. Um, you're going to keep them, keep them on back term for a little bit to make sure that um, they don't come back sick to you again. Um, so with severe disease, you're going to use um, um, IV trimethoprim, <laughs> I, I call it IV back term. That would be good enough. Um, now, you can do an oral if it's mild to moderate disease. Um, it's, uh, your standard is 15 to 20 milligrams per kilograms per day. That's the trimethoprim component. Um, and you're going to treat them for close to a month. And corticosteroids, severe disease, when they're really hypoxic, you're going to give them steroids as well. So uh, if their CD4 count is less than uh, 100, um, you're going to give them back to DS, and you're also going to check for the um, IgG uh, antibodies for the toxic plasma, gondia. This is your organism that you think about pregnant women and not taking out the cat litter because it's in the, the cat fecal material there. Um, but it can be latent and it can just be, that organism can just be there and they may not be infected. Um, they eventually, so this is one of your opportunistic uh, infections and it can involve brain, um, which is a, becomes a really dangerous CNS infection. So you can actually kill two birds with one stone with the, doing the PCP prophylaxis and if they've got that, if they're IgG positive for toxoplasma and their CD4 count less than 100, you just keep them on uh, back from DS daily. Uh, or you can do a, a single strain PO daily if they don't need uh, preventative therapy for toxoplasmosis. We can just do a back from DS three times a week. Um, if they remember it. I felt like it's either all or none. Either take it daily or don't take it at all. If they have a sulfur allergy, you can use Dapsone. It would either a uh, higher dose daily or lower dose three times a day. Um, if you're going to use Dapsone, you need to uh, screen these patients for uh, G6PD deficiency uh, because if you give them Dapsone and they have G6PD deficiency, you're going to send them into the hemolytic anemia. So if they have that, if they have sulfur allergy and their CD4 counts really low and I'm thinking about what I'm going to give them, then I go ahead and send off the lab to get them screened, doesn't matter what. You don't want to just give them the gap so. Oh, that was it. I thought I'll finish by 5.15, maybe earlier. <laughs> And again, I didn't do any hospital work, so 